rates. And I think we're going to hear a lot about that, about that focus. Rod of just like my, uh, my, my general interests. And so, um, again, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I wish this was in person. Hopefully we can do this again, um, uh, next year. Um, so the title of my talk that I switched it up to is variable selection interpretability in black box statistical methods. And I thought I'd make it a little bit more broad to maybe encompass a little bit more of what my group does in terms of what we think about um, in terms of modeling complex traits and in genetic architecture. Um, and hopefully I can uh, make this a little bit more generalizable for people who maybe aren't working statistically, specifically in statistical genetics, but are also thinking about uh, areas of, of other uh, types of biological sciences, so cancer biology and things like that. So for, for those who may not uh, know who I am, um, you know, a recurring research theme in my group and my research program is to take modern computational approaches and develop theory that enable their interpretations to be uh, related back to classic biological principles. So what I like to say is that I'm a, I'm a statistician by training, um, but I don't build really fancy hammers and then go out and look for nails to start uh, hitting this hammer with. I actually care about the actual basic biology that's behind these questions. And so I, I think about us building specific hammers for specific nails and try to answer these particular problems in biology. Now, uh, a, a, a theme of my group is, is this idea of modeling variation across complex traits. And so uh, here what you see is shapes. I have a, a, a side thing I love, love to do is, is ask this question of when can you use shape variation as a way to understand genotypic phenotypic, phenotypic variation. And so here you have a collection of, of bird beaks or, or bones from primates. Um, and this idea of studying features that kind of under, that explain the variation across different species and groups of populations. Um, and so when I think about dissecting phenotypic variation, you know, I could think about your, the uh, variance of a trait as being like an entire pie, right? It's 100%. And what you can do with this pie is you can break it down into uh, different types of components, right? So a lot of times with phenotypic variation, you have a genetic component, you have a component from this variation that's coming from environmental effects, okay? Um, and this genetic variation side can then be broken down to two uh, other kinds of components, right? You have an additive effect, which effectively is the, the, uh, the effect of gene A plus the effect of gene B. And you have this nonlinear effect, right? And you can think about that as, um, you know, gene A times gene B, or even the effect of some gene um, with this interaction of its environment, right? Um, my group thinks about statistical epistasis. So again, going back to this, um, uh, uh, polynomial effect of, of gene A times the effect of gene B, right? And so we'll, when I say nonlinear, we're going to stick in that space um, and, and not so much in the, in the G by E space. So the data that we're going to work with today um, is I'm going to think about traits or, or my response variable Y as being some continuous vector. We could think about this as being crop yield um, in maize uh, or heights in, in human beings. Um, and then our X matrix, the data that we're going to work with here are going to be genotypes. Um, so SNPs um, encoded as 0, 1, or 2, right? And, and that's going to be our data sets. Now, everything I'm going to talk about today are going to be basic like regression type problems, but I'm going to be motivated from the statistical genetics perspective. So, um, you know, in linear models uh, are, are classically used for, for trait mapping, association mapping, and, and uh, genome-wide association studies, right? And so, uh, you know, going back to STAT 101, you know, we have some trait Y, uh, we can re we regress our, our genotypes onto this, um, onto this trait. And, and the, the main thing I like to show about this slide is this idea that, you know, these betas, these effect sizes are really important to everything that we do in terms of linear models and trait mapping. And the reason for that is because once I have an effect size estimate, I can do, um, you know, hypothesis testing with these things, right? And these p-values or from a Bayesian posterior inclusion probabilities, Bayes factors, lend some notion of evidence of how each locus is associated with my given outcome, okay? So these betas are really important. And once I have these betas and these p-values, I can then start visualizing enrichment across traits, right? So for those who may not be aware of what this plot is, on the left-hand side, we have what we call a Manhattan plot, where we have the 22 chromosomes in a human being on the, on, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have negative log transform p-values for every single um, SNP in our data set. And you can see a spike would mean like an enrichment in that given uh, genomic region, right? Then we can go in and see, okay, for this given set of SNPs, you know, maybe what genes or, or genomic unit might be uh, uh, encoded in this region, right? Um, so you can do further downstream analyses, right? But again, this, this plot is enabled by this idea that this, these betas, I can do classic hypothesis testing. 
Now, my group, going back to this idea of studying a pie, you know, we like to think about machine learning methods. And, and the reason we like to do that is because they're, they're typically well suited for prediction tasks, right? Um, and, and, and more so in, in a lot of areas, more so than uh, um, just classic linear models. The, the, the hard part here, though, is a lot of machine learning algorithms are, are classically referred to as black box. And what I mean by black box is you typically have some input. The input goes into an algorithm. Um, from that algorithm, whatever it's kind of doing, it maybe has some hazy implementations. Out is spitting these really nice predictions, right? Now, that's nice in a lot of areas. In, in the context of uh, genome association studies, we kind of want to understand what's going on in the context of this black box, but also we really want to understand how, what's going on in the context of this black box with respect to these inputs, right? With respect to our genotype, right? So my research goal um, a lot of times is to take these methods and provide interpretable ways to summarize the importance of the input variables for these non-parametric, non-linear type of methodologies, okay? And so these inputs in our case are gonna be our genotypes and our outputs are gonna be uh, measurements of our genotypes. So, you know, going back to my pie example, you know, linear models only kind of see a poor portion of this pie, right? We're, we're kind of restricted to this linear assumption. Um, and so we kind of miss this non-linear component. While black box methods, machine learning methods, non-linear regression methods kind of see the entire pie, right? Now the issue is on the left-hand side, I get nice hypothesis testing, classical statistical methodology that I can use to then do follow-up interpretable um, uh, selection analyses with downstream variable selection. On the right-hand side, I don't necessarily get that. So what I try to do is work on the right-hand side while somehow trying to figure out how to yield and give the same interpretability that we have on the left. Okay. And so the convention wisdom in statistics is that smooth nonlinear functions are often more predictive than linear functions, but variable selection is much easier with linear regression. And if I were to take that statement and then convert into something that we would say in statistical genetics, we said that nonlinear models are, are typically better for things like genomic selection, phenotypic prediction, um, but linear models are better for things like GWAS, EQTL mapping types of things. Okay. And so when I think about the components of a, an interpretable model, I think about three basic ingredients that an interpretable model might have. And I think this is really actually important from a statistician's point of view, given that interpretable machine learning is, is, is a very impor uh, important and, and, and growing field uh, as, we, as we speak, right? So when I think about an interpretable model, I think about it as three components. The first is a motivating probabilistic model, right? The second is an, an, a notion of an effect size for every input variable um, into that model. And then the third is this idea of like some statistical metric that we're able then to summarize marker significance, right? So that could be a p-value, um, uh, a posterior inclusion probability, a base factor, or other things that we also use in machine learning, right? And I, I'm going to show you how we kind of think about this, this, this topic um, in a little bit. And so my presentation outline is going to be broken down into two parts. And we're going to break this down into the first part being, well, you can use post hoc approaches for interval machine learning, right? I have some, some method. I can then, after I fit this nonlinear model, then I can figure out how to go back and uh, try to understand what the model had just learned or what how to identify some kind of significance uh, based on what the model had just learned, right? And the second thing that we're gonna think about is, well, maybe what we could do is use real world knowledge as a way to construct architectures of our model where we kind of self-impose interpretability on the method, right? It's not a post hoc measure, but I kind of only allow the model to learn what I think is based on reality, right? And so I give the model interpretations by giving it some architecture. And here we're gonna have neural network architectures that are governed by biology. And so I'll kind of talk about uh, this idea of biologically annotated neural networks or bands, and then how we kind of do this and how we relate this back to, to classic uh, linear models in, in, in GWAS. And so let's talk about a little bit about post hoc approaches um, uh, in this space, right? So again, going back to this idea of nonlinear regression, if you remember my, uh, an earlier slide, we have a linear regression, we had this X beta relationship. Let's kind of relax that assumption a little bit. Let's just assume that we have some function um, uh, I went to Duke, so I'm going to be a little busy in here. Uh, let's assume that we put some prior over this function space, like a Gaussian process. Um, for those who may not have seen a GP before, you know, XI is going to be some genotypes for the i sample. Um, M is going to be some mean um, function over this function space. The K is the most important part here. The K is what gives us this nonlinear kind of arc, uh, structure. It's going to be a covariance function, or if you want to think about it as a similarity me uh, measure, we kind of have some covariance where this K is kind of uh, measuring in some nonlinear way the similarity between uh, 
uh, sample or uh, individual one's genotypes to individual two genotypes. And we can use something like a um, Gaussian kernel to kind of study this in like a nonlinear way, right? Where the Gaussian kernel implicitly enumerates all um, interactions between covariates and in, in, in individual one versus individual two and so on and so forth, right? Now there's an issue with things like GP kernel regressions and these kind of models, because you have, we have what we call the kernel trick issue, right? And the kernel trick issue is this idea that, you know, I start in this high dimensional P genetic genotype space. Um, I can define a kernel function, a Gaussian kernel, and I can take me to what we call an n-dimensional function space, right? It's the space where in my GP, where I'm able to do really nice predictions um, uh, at, at a very like, you know, robust level uh, and study these nonlinearities. The issue though, in, in genetics in many areas of biology is what I actually really wanna know sometimes after I do this really nice prediction is, you know, how does this translate back into the original input covariate space, right? Now, from the context of classical, um, you know, variable selection, there's no kind of inverse function that takes you from once I transform my data to this nonlinear, um, you know, reproducing kernel Hilbert space or some nonlinear uh, function space that allows me to go back to my input space. And so, from the ideas of classical uh, uh, statistics, uh, you know, the classic idea of variable selection is lost when we kind of do these nice transformations. So I spent a lot of time in my PhD thinking about this, um, where you know, we have this nice probabilistic model, but how do I get a notion of effect size after I fit these models, right? So let's take a step back and let's go to, to classic uh, uh, statistics 101, right? Uh, a class that I, that I, uh, I teach linear models at, at Brown. So um, you know, let's go to the linear model space, right? We have a, re a nice regression. Now, an effect size by definition in classic regression is this idea where I take my phenotype and I project it onto the column space of my data, right? So I have some, some X matrix, I take Y, I project it on the column space of X, okay? And that's that effect size. Now I can define this projection in many different ways, okay? But let's just stick to the very classic um, uh, way of doing this. And let's say that uh, this projection is gonna be a generalized inverse, right? This idea of like a least squares projection onto, um, onto my data. And so then I have this effect size beta hats, now, remember, once I have these beta hats, I could do things like hypothesis testing and things like that, right, in this linear regression space. Now, as a parallel to that, let's now look at the nonlinear model space. Um, I'm going to, re again, relax this idea of x beta. Uh, let's now just have some function f, uh, which we can learn. Um, now, an effect size analog to what we had on the left-hand side is instead of taking my response variable y and projecting it onto the column space of x, um, let's take this smooth nonlinear function f and project it onto them the column space of x. Okay. Now let's let's keep it very uh, again. Let's have this be very parallel. Again, I could choose any kind of projection that I want, um, but let's choose again this like, this nice uh, um, generalized inverse projection for this thing. Right. Now there are a few things to, to kind of note here. The first is that these beta tildes are not like these uh, beta hats. Right. They're they're these. Um, uh, in, in a few papers that we have, we've kind of shown that these beta tildes actually have better predictive power once they kind of learn this nice smooth nonlinear function, but this nice analog to what you might see in linear regression, right? Um, I do want to point out that there are other people who are thinking about really nice ways to kind of specify this prediction in different tasks. So let's say that you were trying to learn maybe non-additive effects, uh, specifically maybe pairwise interactions, that you might have a specific projection that, um, that enables you to tease apart these things. My group's not particularly working on that. That was some really nice work from people um, at UT Austin and others who are thinking about how to do this kind of work. Um, so it's really cool seeing people push this forward. So how would I, how would I might use this or, or get these um, uh, uh, effect size analogs in practice, right? So you know, let's assume that we have some completely high, uh, specified hierarchical model. Again, I can't help it. Let's just be Bayesian about this. So let's say we put priors on everything on our hybrid parameters as well. You know, I could set up some kind of MCMC where you know, I, I take a sample from this conditional distribution for f, I take a sample for maybe my hyperparameters. What's really nice is at the bottom, I can have this deterministic step, right? Where every time I see a new f, depending on the empirical projection or deterministic projection that I have, I can then project things back onto my original um, input space and get some idea of an effect size analog for these beta tildes, right? And again, this projection could be anything, but anytime I see a new f, I have some way of computing these beta tildes. 
that's really nice because it allows me to get this kind of idea of an implied posterior distribution uh, for these effect size analogs, right? Um, and then you can think about being, building posterior predictives and, and these kind of out of sample uh, tasks and, and, and things like that, okay? Now these effect size analogs are really, really nice. The, 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 the issue though with them is um, you still can't do variable selection with them, right? Because they're just weights. Um, you know, you can't really take the absolute value of them and things like that it doesn't necessarily work in practice. You know, there's no, you still don't have this nice notion of like hypothesis testing or, or how I like to say, there's no idea of like a null hypothesis here with these beta tildes, right? Sparsity in, in a nonlinear function space doesn't necessarily equate to sparsity maybe in our input space. And so um, we still need an additional step here. So, so while we still get a really nice notion of an effect size and this post hoc kind of idea, you know, I still need to come up with an idea of some statistical metric that allows me to summarize metric uh, significance, okay? Now, there are a lot of ways to do this. I mean, you have in machine learning, you have these ideas like saliency maps and these other kind of like important scores and things like that. Let me kind of add another one to your plate of how to maybe think about how to do a statistical metric that summarizes marker importance um, with some kind of nice idea of like a null hypothesis that, that might be a little bit intuitive. So, um, you know, I like to think about this alternative way of doing things in the context of sports, okay? So I want everyone to kind of stay with me for a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm uh, virtually in the Midwest. So let's just take a basketball team, um, any team, okay? Now that team collectively together um, as a network, right? Might have a set of information that it, uh, that it holds, right? So as a network collectively all together, I understand like about all these genes in my data set, I understand uh, over the some posterior, maybe how these genes are connected. And I understand uh, the context of this network in the, in the, with relationship to my, to my phenotype, right? So as a whole, um, I have some, some network as a team. Now, the way I can understand how each gene is important or, um, or, or relative to this basketball team, how, how important each player is in the context of this, of this team, is I could take each player and put them on injury reserve, right? So let's say I take number 30 in the, in the corner here and I put him on injury reserve, right? Now, without number 30's information around, I might have lost some kind of idea about the structure of my network, but maybe not uh, a lot, right? Now, let's say I take another random person. I don't know, anybody. Let's close our eyes and pick someone. And, and let's say that I put him on injury reserve, okay? Now, let's say that he wants to go shoot Space Jam or he's going to go play baseball for a little bit. Without him not around on the team, I might lose a lot more information about the structure of my network than I would have without number 30 being around, right? And so what I can do is I could take each individual player, iteratively put them on injury reserve and then study the distance between the, the amount of information I have or the full distribution with everyone kind of around and the conditional distribution with that individual player not being around, right? As a way to kind of study the relative importance of that individual player's impact on the team, right? Now we can quantify this by using KL divergences, right? So the way to kind of summarize the influence in, in, uh, of the, the variant uh, XJ on the rest of the variants in my data set is to measure the KL divergence between the conditional distribution um, with that player's effect being equal to zero in the marginalized distribution with me having marginalized over that player's um, information, okay? So here, a KL divergence being equal to zero can easily be interpreted as that variant is not a key explanatory variable relative to the others. Or alternatively, the KL divergence is zero if and only if the conditional distribution is equal to that marginal, right? There's no separate. So the rate measure that we kind of that we came up with was this idea of taking these KL divergences and then scaling them um, so that they're on a, on a scale from zero to one, right? Now we do that for, for a few reasons, but the, the most nice reason I think that we that comes out of this is you get an idea of a null hypothesis when you do this, right? Rate null hypothesis is that every single variant in my data set is contributing equally to the variance of my phenotype. And the alternative is that everyone that that some players are contributing more. Okay, so this idea of one over P is my null. It's the idea that once I scale these KL divergences, all the KLs for every single player in my data set is the same, right? 
everyone is equally important relative to each other, right? It's like I'm saying I have a bunch of bench players on my team, right? And the alternative is that I have a few superstars, okay? So let me kind of show you how this works in, in practice, just for some basic simulations. Um, like, let's say I have uh, 2,000 samples, right? Something very basic. Let's say I have um, 25 genetic markers. That's like 23, 24, and 25 be the only causal variables in my data set, right? That's going to be my Jordan, Pippin, and Robin, okay? Um, they're going to be the only ones that have a non-zero effect on my phenotype. What we're going to do is we're going to fit a Gaussian Gal process. I'm going to compute these effect size analogs, and I'm going to compute these rate measures for every single variable in my data set. And then I'm going to look at how these look like in terms of uh, importance for every single variable, okay? So we do that, we do these runs, and what you can see is um, Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman uh, are the three best players on my team, right, as, as identified by rate. So on the left hand, on the y-axis, you have these rate measures. Um, on the, um, the x-axis, you have every single variable. That red line is that one over p line. That's the idea where I have no stars on my team, okay? Now, what we can do is I can, uh, to kind of give you a notion of what I mean by relative, um, centrality or this idea of everyone being on a bench player is I could take Jordan out of the game and then I can iteratively remove everyone else. So my conditional distribution now is Jordan's effect being set to zero and everyone else's effect being set to zero with him, okay? Now, when I do that um, and recompute these rate measures, what you'll see is that um, Pippin and Robin are still my best players, right? On the, on the, left, on the far right-hand side but the importance of all the other uh, variables have gone up. But there's two things to notice, they've gone up uniformly, right? Um, and, and that's like saying that, um, and, and they're all hovering now over this like one over P line, right? And that's like saying that I've lost 40 points a game and these 40 points have to come from someone, right? But it's not gonna initially fall on any one given player because they're all basically noise. And so th the idea that they're all gonna be important together, they should all rise up importance like at about the same rate, right? Um, we can do this again, put Jordan and Pippin out now, iteratively put everyone else on in reserve with the two stars. What you'll see is I have Rodman still as being identified, but I still kind of have everyone hovering around this line. Again, everyone kind of rises uniformly. We do the same thing, we take all three stars out together and everyone's kind of hovering over this kind of one over P. Um, now we could do a sanity, could you sanity checks here, which is like, okay, what if I remove um, number 30 out instead? You can see kind of nothing changes. Um, and alternatively, you could say, okay, uh, what if I could just create a data set with just straight noise? You can see stochastically everyone kind of hovers around this, this one over P line. So, uh, you know, in, in, in real data set, let's, let's go to a real data set setting now. So here I have some um, a mouse data set from the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. Uh, there's approximately 2,000 mice here, 10,000 SNPs. Um, I really like this data set because it has 129 different traits, characterizing these six different broad categories. Um, but what's really nice about them is the genetic architecture for each of these traits is quite different. So you might have additive effects that are highly, um, that, are, that are dominating the architecture of a trait for one. In another case, you might have third order, like three, uh, three pair type interactions that dominate for another. It's, it's a really nice data set if you're really looking for a diversity. Um, in trade architecture. Uh, here, let's just focus on HDL content. And I'm just gonna compare this to like a single like T-test effect, like a single SNP GWAS set um, for a trait that has a little bit of nonlinear structure in, in it, right? So at the top, you can see this rate measure uh, across, again, this is another Manhattan plot. Uh, Y-axis is the is our rate measure. The, at the bottom is a single SNP thing where we have a, a enrichment for uh, negative log 10 transform p-values. The chromosomes are on the x-axis. Uh, these stars are actually uh, 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 functionally discovered uh, stud, uh, uh, genomic regions from a different study. So we kind of see like how more we're able to line this up for this particular trait. Um, this trait actually has a, a fair amount of nonlinear structure. And so you can see how the single SNP model kind of misses the structure where the GP is able to pick this up. Now, the things that are not so great about rate, right, which is, you know, how do I, in practice, how do I figure out what this like uh, statistical significance or, or uh, multiple corrected hypothesis testing line might actually be? And so there, there are things about this post hoc procedure that's not necessarily perfect, right? I think rate is a very intuitive measure, but it's not something that maybe if you were um, a practitioner and you were saying, okay, as P goes to infinity, that, that, that threshold of what I'm gonna call to be significant is gonna go down to zero. So what do I think about doing next year, right? So, so rate's not, the perfect scheme if you're thinking about very high dimensional data sets. Um, but it is a nice intuitive scheme if you're working in these kind of mid, 
mid-level techniques. Um, and so the, the, the shortcomings of this measure kind of brought me to the second part of this talk, right? And um, so I'll spend the rest of this time here, again, going back to my epistatic arrhythmia for these phenotypes. Um, again, these are 129 different traits. Um, again, what we could do is you could take a variance component analysis and kind of say, okay, um, out of these different types of effects, whether they be additive at the top, pairwise interactions, third order interactions, or some kind of common environmental interactions, because these mice were bred in a certain way where uh, you kind of have a, a nice set of cage effects with them. Uh, you can ask, okay, which uh, effect is actually dominating? You can see, you know, one motivation for these nonlinear or maybe even machine learning methods in, in genetics and genomics are these cases where, uh, particularly for model organisms, um, where you don't necessarily have a, a st additive structure, you can have this kind of nonlinear structure at play. Um, and so that's kind of a nice motivation for, you know, uh, why these interval metrics uh, in, in um, nonlinear regression uh, might be quite helpful. But like I said, there's still a downside to this, which is like a, the classic idea of, okay, what do I draw some kind of hard cut threshold for this method? And so that kind of got us starting on this idea of, you know, taking a step back and maybe not doing post hoc uh, uh, me measures for, for variable selection, but maybe thinking about how to self-impose um, interpretability on these models ourselves, right? And so that brought this reason my second, my second step where, you know, I have these nice, uh, 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 three checkpoints for post hoc, but can we also do this if maybe I start from a place where um, I'm going to impose some kind of interpretability on my model first, right, and then figure out a way to kind of get these nice three checks, okay? So this idea of neural network architecture being governed by biology is something that my group has really been thinking about um, in terms of how to do nonlinear variable selection in the context of genome-wide association studies but in a case that looks more like what we do in classical um, uh, linear regression, okay? Um, this is a collaborative effort um, that I've been actually really super excited about that's been led by uh, Pinar Demechi and Wei Chang at uh, Brown University, as well as Hugh Hay, who is an MSR um, in New England RA, and he'll soon be in your neck of the woods um, as an MD PhD student at UChicago. Um, so what's really nice about neural networks uh, is uh, I've seen a lot of people talk about this stuff on stuff on Twitter, and I completely agree, as it, maybe it's just like a statistician to me, this idea that neural networks are just fancy uh, nonlinear methods, right, or, or just fancy linear algebra, like going to the hood, right? And so, um, you know, you can write a, a probabilistic neural network as a nonlinear model, right? So we can think about, again, we have some inputs. Our inputs here, again, in this setting will still be genotypes um, you know, your hidden layers are just a linear combination of the weights in your input layer, as well as the, um, the, the covariate that you get, right? So the linear combination, and then you have some kind of activation function that you, uh, that you use to kind of, uh, whether it be a ReLU or something like that, that gives you a nonlinear transformation. And really nice work from people recently that have kind of shown what these uh, uh, activation functions are actually doing in terms of what they're actually implicitly enumerating. Um, you know, I, I can still be really basing about things and I can put priors on any of these weights, right? The output layer is then just a, a linear, uh, linear combination of my hidden neurons, um, as well as the weights and the output layer. And that gives me this nice F, right? F, you could think about that as being the same kind of F that I showed in the previous setting, right? Some nonlinear um, uh, function or estimate. Um, here in this context F, we could then have some transformation uh, in terms of our phenotype Y, and that's what that sigma gives, whether that, if I'm looking at case control data or continuous data, then this sigma would just be the identity. Um, we can be Bayesian about this, where we could put priors on things, right, and have a Bayesian neural network. Um, it's really nice, because there's a really nice parallel between classic regression type methods and what we can do with like neural networks, right? Now, this is what we call a fully connected network, right? Where every single uh, input neuron or input node is connected to a hidden layer, uh, a node in the hidden layer, right? Um, now, let's, let's stick in this kind of architecture. Let's remember at least this, this um, pinkish box at the bottom here of how you might write this from a probabilistic perspective, okay? Now, there's a, there's a really nice thing that we have actually in, in um, genetics where we kind of have a nice hierarchical nature to the way that we think about um, uh, the organization, uh, uh, you know, of genomic units, right? And when we think about enrichment studies, okay? So again, this is a Manhattan plot. Um, these are going to be, uh, these are now posterior inclusion probabilities. So um, 
uh, this is uh, from a Bayesian model. So here uh, on a scale from zero to one, right? One being enriched for that given uh, trait. Um, the things are um, black and gray for no specific reason other than just to, to help people look at these things from an alternating color perspective. Um, you know, blue in this study was a pre previously identified loci and, and, and red was something that was potentially novel. What I really wanna draw your attention to here is every point here is a, is a SNP. Right, and, and we know uh, along these genomic regions, uh, potentially what coding regions or, or um, that each SNP maybe uh, is a part of, we can actually go across these genome, the genome and kind of like annotate, you know, uh, which regulatory unit per se that a SNP might be involved with, right? And so you kind of have this nice uh, uh, hierarchical annotation that you kind of get across the genome, right? So we can say that these blue SNPs are a part of this gene and so on and so forth. Or maybe these, these SNPs are in this intergenic region or something like that, right? So what this kind of said to me is, um, well, we kind of have a really nice hierarchical nature to things where, you know, I have this predefined gene list. I kind of know where if I have a certain gene, I know what chromosome it's on. I know the start and end position for that, chrome, uh, for that gene um, annotation. And then I know what SNPs fall within that given window, right? And so why can't I use this information to kind of inform my neural network architecture? And here's what I mean, and stick with me with this visual. On the bottom, we have another Manhattan plot. Again, I have all these SNPs. These red dots here are genes annotated for each of these SNPs, right? Now, if you're looking at this, what I could actually do is if I rotate this neural network or this, this um, Manhattan plot on its axis, it kind of looks like a partially connected neural network, okay? So stay with me. If I rotate this, I kind of have a partially connected neural network. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, my input layer, if I'm looking at this left-hand side, are my SNPs. SNPs can be, if I say that I'm going to limit the connection from input layer to hidden layer only based on what I know that this particular SNP is annotated for, um, then I kind of now self-impose a definition onto my hidden layer, right? Every hidden neuron now is now a gene or a SNP set, however I define, describe, uh, decide to define it. Um, and that kind of gives me an interpretation on both the SNPs, the hidden neurons, as well as the weights that are a, a, a corresponding um, uh, to each set, right? So this is effectively what bands is, is taking these annotations and imposing them so that we're able to now think about how to do classic variable selection, okay? Now, the, the idea of this is that, you know, the interpretability uh, of, of bands comes in a few spaces. It, also, it comes from this partially connected architecture, but it's also gonna come from how we decide to learn each of these weights, right? So let's go back to the, remember that, that very first fully connected network where I said, where you can write a neural network based on some linear, uh, non-linear looking model, you know, bands works if I took individual level GWAS data, you know, I start with some genotypes. Um, I have a SNP set annotation um, uh, matrix or, or, or list where I know these are my given SNP sets. These are the chromosomes that you can start on, start in position, the SNPs that are involved with them. In panel B, I can then take these annotations, create a partially connected neural network, right? Where each of these nodes are, um, are, are now my input layer for my SNPs, only connect to a SNP set layer and the hidden layer, and then also as well to the phenotypes. And the key part here is then I can write this as like a hierarchical nonlinear regression model, right? Where I have some full model specification for how I am modeling my phenotype. Again, my phenotype is just uh, on the last layer is a linear combination of my hidden neurons and the weights from that um, uh, from that layer. I can then think about how to put priors on things that are that are reflective of how I think effects are distributed on both maybe across SNPs and maybe also across genes or across pathways or so on and so forth. So we can put priors on things and, and then what I can learn now is like posterior inclusion probabilities for which SNP sets are included in terms of learning my trait, as well as which SNPs are included in terms of learning my trait, right? Now, what's really nice about bands is this is a really flexible architecture, right? So I can think about this on an individual level where I actually have access to, to people's genotypes and their phenotypes. But I can also think about this in terms of summary statistics, right? So I can think about this in terms of, well, if I don't have access to, the, to someone's genotypes and phenotypes, you know, maybe I have access to 
the effect size estimates from some others meta not some other person's meta analysis, and I might have access to like a reference panel in terms of looking at their um, LD matrix, right? So bands also works on some resistance as well. Now we think about even taking it a step further, which is okay. What if I have multiple traits? Then again, you can also again flexibly model this. Again, we're thinking about this as like a non-linear regression model. The same way that you could do multi-trait learning um, and regression-based techniques, you can also do this here and kind of learn enrichments across traits while pulling, you know, leveraging the covariance maybe across different um, trait architectures. And so the components of the bands model is just that, you know, I've self-imposed interpretability. You know, I, I started with some probabilistic model because of my restriction is partially connected architecture. I now have a notion of effect size. That notion of effect size is each of those weights for corresponding to either SNPs or SNP sets. And then these posterior inclusion probabilities basically saying how sparse I should learn this partially connected model is then going to give me a physical metric that I can summarize marker importance with. Okay. Um, so in practice, what we use, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of this uh, as I kind of wrap up here, um, is we use a variational EM algorithm to fit this and estimate all model parameters. Right? Um, this, is, this is mainly derived and a little bit tweaked from uh, Carbonell and Stevens' paper in uh, Bayesian analysis. Um, what we're going to say is the posterior mean for the weights of non-associated non SNPs in this model, because we're making sparse, are going to be set to zero, right? And the key part here is that we're going to end up doing variable selection with these posterior inclusion probabilities, right? This idea of the probability of any given weight is going to be uh, not equal to zero, right? What's really nice is, in, because of this like hard part, the, the enrichment on the gene layer is going to be also conditioned on which SNPs are included in, in the model, right? So it's going to, it's also going to include like the sparsity of, of SNPs. It's also going to help me inform which SNP sets should be included. Um, so let me kind of show you how this works in, in simulations, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of this thing, because <laughs> that I think there are a lot of positives, but also some things that could definitely be improved. So um, let's look at this from just chromosome one of individuals who self-identify as being of European ancestry, UK biobank. Um, we're going to use just uh, a, a, the basic uh, uh, RefSeq database to be able to annotate each SNP for, for genes on this chromosome. Let's have a moderately high uh, process irritability for the context of this talk. Um, in the paper, there are like 64 pages of supplementals, so you know we consider a ton of different scenarios. So I, 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 I definitely encourage people to go and take a look if you're interested. Uh, these results are going to be based on 100 different simulated replicates. Okay. Um, so what we did in this in this paper is we said, um, okay, if if bands can identify both SNPs and SNP sets um, appropriately, then what we actually want to uh, assess it on is this ability. Um, to beat state-of-the-art methods or, or compete against state-of-the-art methods um, that do uh, that identify SNPs on SNP level, and then as well as those that identify more SNP set enrichment type methods. And so we looked at things across different architectures. Um, you're going to see this kind of a lot. Of, this is sparse versus polygenic architecture. What that effectively means is sparse is again going back to this idea that um, I have few SNPs that are contributing to the variance of my out of my trait. Going back to my pi example, the reason why the sparse architecture is easy. Because if I take this pi and let's say I only have 10 causal SNPs, I would just divide this pi into 10 slices. Each SNP is going to get quite a large piece of that pi, right? Versus the polygenic case, if I, let's say I have now 100 SNPs that are contributing to the output of my trait, I have a pi, I divide that into 100 slices. Those slices for each effect for every SNP is going to get much, much tinier, right? So the polygenic architecture trait is going to be much harder for the variable SNPs. Okay. Um, uh, we can also look at this in terms of um, uh, identifying on the gene level as well against enrichment-based methods. Um, there is a trick here that I also want to kind of mention that we've been working quite, quite a lot at, you know, improving the runtime of bands, especially on this like SNP set level uh, against the SNP set level counterparts is really important to us. Um, you know, score-based methods are very quick. Um, things like bands are assessed, these, these regression-based methods are not as quick, right, because they're doing these like uh, even in even a very uh, variational setting, you know, trying to identify like some approximate posterior, it's not as fast as some of these score based methods. So that is an area of, of great improvement for bands. Um, what we what what a reviewer asked us to do, which I actually really appreciated, this idea of you know pushing us on what is actually contributing to the performance of bands, right? So kind of taking our model, we did as an ablation test, where we took our model, basically broke it apart by each piece, right? 
And um, there are these different components of, of what will actually contribute to uh, the effectiveness of the model, where if we didn't actually have that component, the model's performance wouldn't be quite as high. And so we actually kind of mess with this a lot. What I really actually appreciated about this, I mean, there are things that are really important, like how you initialize parameters. Um, we do this actually really nice model averaging trick that is used in other uh, papers from, from Matthew Stevens' group that, that also really helps. Um, but the one thing I actually really appreciated about this ablation test was um, the nonlinear activation, removing that and making it just a linear activation actually has no real effect for additive traits. If you can see that blue line, that blue dash line. Um, but it does actually play a role when you add some nonlinear effects to the architecture of the trait. And so I actually kind of showed that like this is actually contributing in some, some way uh, to our power here, which I actually thought was pretty cool. Um, the, the variational EM algorithm is not perfect, right? So in, in, the, in the paper, what we show is that um, you can, for, for very highly polygenic um, architectures, what the variational EM algorithm is going to do is it's going to act similarly to a lasso. What BANDS is going to do is it's going to prioritize preserving um, uh, uh, like a type 1 error, but you also might get type 2 error as a result of that, right? And so if you have two highly, highly correlated SNPs, high in LD, it's going to act like the lasso, where the lasso, what the lasso is going to do is it's going to select um, just one of those things, right? The uh, variational EM is also going to do something very similar. It's going to pick one and, and then completely, almost completely downweight the inclusion probability of the other. It doesn't necessarily act like a fully Bayesian model where you might take the posterior inclusion probability and split those up across correlated SNPs. Um, so that is something to, to see. So what you see is you kind of see underestimated um, uh, uh, effect sizes or weights sometimes for, for very complex architectures. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is, a, this is estimating heritability across the different traits. Um, uh, on the left hand, far left hand side, we have just additive effects. And you can see how nicely we actually are able to recover heritability. Heritability here is just studying the variance across um, get our given weights in the input layer or, or SNP set layer uh, for these different runs. We actually have really nice precision there for that. But as you can see, as we add complexity, whether that be adding um, nonlinear effects or adding polygenicity to the trait, we start to underestimate this. And so uh, part of future work here, I think, is trying to figure out how to maybe not deal um, uh, or, or how to be better estimate this while not losing uh, scalability, right? And so that's a, that's a challenge here is trying to think about new ways to maybe fit this model um, uh, that allows us to maybe avoid these issues. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's a main point that I think we make throughout the paper, and I'm happy also to talk about this offline. Um, for our last thing, we did a, a real data analysis using the UK Biobank and Framingham Heart Study. Um, to make things comparable, what we did is we actually, uh, we studied the Framingham Heart Study first with these 6,900 individuals, uh, 390,000 uh, SNPs. We took a random, um, subset of 10,000 individuals who self-identify as being of European ancestry. And we filter these genotypes so that they have the exact same numbers as a way to maybe see, like maybe we're able to maybe replicate things, how well does SUSE and RSS also perform across these different um, uh, traits, um, how much agreement is there between our method as well as those other uh, benchmarks. Um, and then we considered these 18,000 SNP sets, um, both genes and intergenic regions between genes um, using this RefC database. Um, the trait here you're going to see is LDL uh, proteins. And so um, here what you're seeing is um, uh, on, the, on the top is as a premium heart study. On the bottom is, is the UK Biobank. Um, we have these different symbols of like stars and things. That, uh, what's really actually nice is there actually was um, some replication both across um, uh, data sets, but also across um, the methods. And so certain, certain uh, SNPs actually we, we were identified that, that SUSE and RSS were. And then there were a lot that, that SUSE and RSS uh, miss, but it was it was nice to kind of see this this uh, uh, very exhaustive analysis, and I really appreciated um, reviewers asking us to do this. Um, so with that, I'll I'll try to wrap up so I can at least take some questions. Um, you know, future and ongoing work is is quite a quite a bit, and and I kind of want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Um, you know, I like this idea of this generalized uh, framework, to, and I want to take bands and kind of have it serve as a scalable generalized nonlinear mixed model type of idea. So you know, some of the things that we're trying to work on is, um, you know, bands, uh, we haven't tried bands on, on uh, uh, categorical or dichotomous type traits. 
Um, you know, I've talked to people uh, who give me really good suggestions. You know, there's a, there's a lot of literature on some of these like partially connected um, ideas, particularly for graphical models um, as a way as another alternative. Um, uh, I think we, we cite a few of those in our paper as well. There's some, some really cool ideas from other areas. We came at this from uh, the linear model uh, dissecting variance type of idea that we typically do in, in genetics, but there are a lot of areas in genomics where, um, you know, some of these other type of model structures might be really cool and might be really useful to use. Um, we've been thinking about how to develop theory for bands to work for small data sets um, in genomic studies, particularly from a uh, multimodal perspective. And we have a paper that'll be coming out really soon on, on some of these ideas. Um, you know, it'd be great if N was infinity in, in all uh, uh, spaces. Uh, genetics think we're really lucky where we have hundreds of thousands of samples, but what happens if you don't have that? Is there a way to maybe think about how to use uh, Bayesian inference um, uh, in this kind of framework in order to do, uh, you know, differential expression enrichment type analyses and things like that? Um, you know, BANS doesn't model other sources of variation either, which is quite difficult. Um, you know, we, we only typically, um, you know, we're used to that we are able to regress out most of population structure and things like that. But, you know, we don't take into account maybe cryptic structure that's coming from G by E interactions that are on, uh, that are, um, uh, you know, unaccounted for other sources of population variation and stratification. And so we don't necessarily do that. We do a lot of um, cryptic structure analyses in our simulations, but we don't explicitly figure out how to model that. And so there's something that in our in our band's architecture that we would love to figure out how to do and make this more of a linear mixed model versus just like a nonlinear model type of framework. Um, and, and lastly, you know, I have this idea of, of doing shapes and I'm, I'm still into imaging. And so uh, one thing that we've also been thinking about is, you know, instead of grouping, you know, SNPs into genes together, are there ways to think about an imaging and, and shape-based analyses maybe where you, where you group um, vertices or voxels together based on regions of interest um, in other areas of, of, of biology. And so that's been a lot of fun to also think about. So on the bottom here, you have a brain tumor from the TCGA that we've reconstructed using uh, convolutional neural networks. And we're actually able now to like, uh, you know, model these meshes in really cool ways to kind of and we get at, again, get at this question of shape variation as a way to understand things like variation. That's been super fun. Um, so to end, I just say uh, this has been a huge collaborative uh, thing. I, I want to really want to thank all of my key contributors, whether that be from the Rate Project as, all, as well as the Band Project. Um, people have been really nice to give us money. Um, here's some relevant references. Um, there's software at the bottom. Rate is written in R. Band is actually written in Python and R. Um, and there's a, sort of a few notebooks on how to uh, actually use it. Um, and the most re most recent revised version just came out for this manuscript last week. So. Um, yeah, happy to take questions. Thanks so much for everyone listening. Thank you, Lauren, uh, for that great talk. So we have, just to, I mentioned this in the chat too, for anyone that has questions, please use the Q&A feature. We already have a number of questions in there. It's cool. also possible to upvote questions. So if you wanna see one of those questions answered uh, that someone else asked, just upvote it and we'll make sure that one gets addressed first. And Let's start with one of those. We have one that's getting a lot of votes here. Sure. Um, the question is, uh, is it possible to include other variables such as molecule abundances, in parentheses, protein, metabolites, mRNA expression with the genotype data? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, there are any, so there are, there are a few ways to do this. Um, if you think that you can group these things collectively into maybe a single neuron that makes sense for your application, absolutely. One thing that we've thought about that we didn't necessarily get too far on, but I would love to hear other people's thoughts, uh, maybe uh, in a cop session or something, is um, you know if you have uh, multimodal type of data, so you have you know uh, this uh, multi-omic type of study, but maybe there is some kind of hierarchical nature to them, and so you don't necessarily know how to maybe group them because maybe one feeds into the other, but you don't know how to necessarily introduce them to the model in a way that makes still like that hierarchical sense. That would be great to kind of listen to people's thoughts on. But there are there you can easily include other types of uh, molecular data. Um, you also don't have to do. I also want to make this very clear. You don't have to do genes. Uh, we did genes because it was easy um, and it was something that was intuitive for us. But you can think about other types of genomic units that make uh, that make sense um, for your particular study. So you could even and then you don't have to have a shallow model either. You can go as deep as you want, 
Um, and you could think about, you know, maybe genes, uh, maybe uh, grouped into pathways or proteins or whatever. And so you can have other types of units as well as you kind of move out in the model. Um, so there's a lot of extension to kind of work with both um, here and, and here, <laughs> that, however you want to play with it. Thank you. We have another popular question that uh, an anonymous attendee posted. Uh, so a great approach. Will adding EQTL gene associations and protein-protein interaction data be useful? perhaps as additional hidden layers to refine the analysis. Yeah, I'm wondering absolutely. if this will also allow us to look into biologically verified interactions as associated with phenotypes. So sort of related to the first question, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So we, so yeah, I, we stopped. Uh, we, we decided to do our, uh, this methodology and then stop because I, I don't think the supplementals could have gotten any longer if we tried. Um, but that's a really good point. I think that there are um, other ways to get at more biologically refined questions that we definitely didn't get to. Um, what I like about the model is it is pretty flexible. And so um, definitely, I think if that's something that people are interested in, that that is something that you can easily, um, easily do. What the band software takes now, if I can actually say this, is um, it, it takes annotation files. So you give it your design matrix, whatever that might be, omic data, whatever. Um, you give it a phenotype, then you tell the model um, how you want different things to be grouped. And it groups those things for you. So you give it like a binary mask file and then it, it, it makes those things for you. And so however, as deep as you wanna go, that is something you could, you could potentially do for sure. Um, okay, thank you. We have another question uh, from Negan. Uh, Thanks, awesome talk. What about the curse of high dimensionality? Do you think this structure will minimize it or can you please comment on that? Yeah, so, um, um, so okay, so there's a few curses here for, for this. For, for the current implementation, um, you know, uh, getting higher and higher scalability, we have to like rethink that. And I think we're still trying to push on that. Um, curse of high dimensionality, when you think about correlated effects, like I said before, um, your power can be messed with, right? So. Um, BANDIS is going to favor type one over type two errors. And so if you have a lot of highly correlated variables, the way that the EM works, you're going to select just, you're going to select a few out of the subset of correlated variables. So that is something to really keep in mind is um, uh, the current uh, model estimation procedure is definitely not perfect. And so there, those are two immediate ways where I think we can uh, really improve is um, maybe moving away for the variational EM, which has been well documented of having its, its shortcomings, and then we also well document those in our own paper. Um, so maybe thinking about other things like maybe uh, we've been thinking about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo type of things and things like moving away from maybe the variational EM is a, is a way to think about that. Um, so yeah, those are two immediate areas where uh, bands is definitely not perfect at its given uh, construction right right now. Thank you. We have a bunch more questions. Like, you know, <laughs> thank you for uh, all the, the questions, everyone. Uh, one question from an, another anonymous attendee. Very great talk. Is there a reason why only UK biobank individuals of European ancestry were used in the application? Mm, yeah, because we can imagine. Point. Yeah, no, some, sorry, sorry. And go ahead. And they say, I can imagine sample size would be the case, but only 10K were used. Right, right, right. right. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, Yes, so we only used that group um, because we I didn't know we didn't really know how to how to how to do population structure type of thing. So I would have loved to use other individuals. Uh, we didn't necessarily control for population structure there. The other reason is just because we wanted to have at least 10k individuals. Um, and so thinking about um, other types of uh, the, the sample sizes for the other groups in UK biobank are much smaller. And, and we had seen in simulations that we actually do quite worse if we have smaller uh, sample sizes. So 10K was kind of our, our magic number. Um, you know, we, we should have done a more exhaustive data, uh, data analysis. I actually would have loved to do that. We have a paper recently on um, thinking about these like replication type questions in, in multi-ancestry based studies. And um, I really wish we had gone back and, and done that. Um, what I would love to do is going back to my last slide of figuring out how to deal with cryptic structure um, and figure out if, if, if bands is something that we can use where you're able to combine individuals from multiple populations together without necessarily having to think about how to bend different groups of people, that would be amazing. And so we've been thinking about that as well. 
Um, one thing that's also related to this question, I think, is that we haven't done prediction with this model either, which is interesting if people are thinking about this from a PRS perspective. And I don't know if that's something that ring a bell for anyone, but um, that heritability slide kind of suggests that for, for if we're not dealing with structure quite well, transferability of the model for, um, uh, while power might be great for you to be able to do variable selection at a high rate, transferability of the model in terms of predictive accuracy might not be that great, especially if you're thinking about, again, from a diverse population type of point of view, that might not, bands might not be the best model as constructed right now for that. You might want to think about other types of, again, model estimation and things like that that are able to generalize over different um, types of uh, uh, structure across individuals. So um, that's, a, that's a great question, a great point. I actually really appreciate someone asking it. All right, so I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question about sample size. So Kun Feng Dong says, thanks for the great work. Do you think that a typical GWAS sample size is good enough to train your neural network approach? So um, how many samples do you think are necessary? Right. So we so we only worked at, we looked at ten thousand and above. So um, I would say I would say at least that. What we saw. So when we first were playing with the model, we were playing with things at five thousand, and it it wasn't amazing. I think the variational EM needed uh, a larger sample size. So when we moved to ten thousand, we really started seeing the power that you saw in the simulations. Um, bands works right now as constructed up to like a. Um, like a, a few hundred thousand individuals. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, in a um, few hundred thousand individual, individuals on unimputed data, that's a, that's a key part. So, you know, ex, uh, going to an imputed data set, we have millions of SNPs. I think bands might not be the best scalability wise as constructed right now. And so we still, we're still trying to figure out how to tweak the model so that we're able to reach those large, large sample sizes. Um, and so that's, that's a really good question as well. I appreciate that one. 